Welcome to Inside Quest. We're the innovation incubator for your mind. Our goal is to bring on amazing people who can fill your brain with pure genius. And if you're a lifelong learner looking to level up your intellect, there's no better guest than the man joining us today. He's a powerhouse high school educator who has gained national attention for working with other like-minded teachers to turn a TED Talk from Daniel Pink into an educational revolution. Hell-bent to bunker bust the outdated educational model of subservient students and out-of-touch teachers, he's a vanguard for the exciting educational reform that's taking place in schools across this country at this very moment. His often controversial methods have raised ire in the more traditionally minded, but they have also delivered staggering results. His students have lectured at Stanford University, written and produced an on-air television commercial, collaborated with countless high-level entrepreneurs in prestigious universities, filed for and received multiple patents and executed projects that have been reported on by the national media, all before graduating high school. He is a self-proclaimed perpetual student who is bringing Silicon Valley style innovation labs to today's youth by shifting the focus away from grades and standardized tests to creativity and critical thinking and showing his students how to learn from failure and the criticism that comes from sharing your work with the world. The immense body of information that he has published on and offline is an indispensable resource for parents, educators, and business leaders alike, as well as students all over the world. This guy's openness, transparency, and hunger for self-improvement are inspiring, and his book, Pure Genius, Building a Culture of Innovation and Taking 20% Time to the Next Level, shows anyone interested how they can build a culture of creativity and passionate pursuit into their family, classroom, or business. Please help me in welcoming the man who is finally making the classroom a safe place to fail, the educational wizard behind the wealth of worldly knowledge that is the InnovativeTeacher.com, the winner of Centric's Indiana Innovation Award and host of Innovated on BAM Radio Network, Don Wetrick. Um, I know this is kind of a staple of your show. Who writes your intros? I might make my mom and dad blush. <laughs> uh, well, well, we'll have to play it for them on a loop. I, yeah, can I use that? Absolutely, man. Go have crazy. Have it go maybe even at my house. <laughs> I think that's smart. Yeah, yeah. So, I, first of all, I got to say, I am such a fan of the show um, and just getting connected with you. I remember listening to when you said you wanted your employees to be as jealous and possessive and with their time. And uh, that's when I reached out to you because it was weird hearing you talk. It was like hearing myself talk to my students and that a lot of people say, you know, what is this class about? What do, what do you do? And, and I said, well, if I gave you an hour and a half every other day to work on the things you always wanted to work on, what would you do? That's the class. It's interesting that you say that. So when you reached out to me, and for those of you who don't know, so he reached out blindly on Twitter and was just like, hey, I'm doing this class. You should check it out. It'd be great. Our students would love to speak with you. Did, spoke to his students, was really blown away with just sort of how present they were. And some of the concepts that they had, I would consider very high level business concepts. The stuff that I normally tell people are sort of the advanced level stuff, way beyond where you start somebody on a transformation. And these were like, 15 year old kids. So it was really this jarring disconnect for me and, and started digging into you. And um, as somebody who hires the people that you're training in the educational system in general, it was so fascinating to me that somebody's really attacking that problem. And for me, it came from a place, one of the biggest problems that I ultimately want to tackle in my life is generational poverty. Mm. And that saying generational poverty to me is very important because it's people that are robbed of a social network. It's people that are robbed of certain um, family cultural values that are monetarily useful. So they may grow up in a household with tons of love and, and and they feel all that sense of connectedness to their family, but it doesn't spread into the greater world and it doesn't open up doors of opportunity for them. So that cycle then repeats. Um, and seeing that you were taking kids and teaching them high level business concepts with no necess I mean, obviously your school is very supportive philosophically, but there was no curriculum, right? Mm -hmm. And one story I'd love to hear from you is how you convinced the school board, by the way, to do an sure. innovation class, which I know you use some wording in the uh, core curriculum to get them to do that. But that gave me the first glimmer of, of insight into how one could actually go into uh, this problem of generational poverty and make real change. I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's what we're kind of um, hell-bent on. So the genesis of this class, I was 
I always remember where I was sitting. It just it was an email from a dear friend and it said, watch this. And it was Daniel Pink's TED Talk. The very next class, I showed it to, at then, my freshman English class. Um, and I was like, what do you guys think of that? And they're like, oh, finally, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course they said it'd be great because it'd be a class about them. They said, okay, so let's start it. And I go, let's start it Friday. And um, it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible because they told me, yeah, finally a class, yeah, I'm gonna do if things I'm gonna be interested in. And then I'm like, all right, what are you interested in? Well, what do you want me to be interested in? Right. So um, there was like two or three projects that were really, really, really good. And so I asked the principal, I'm like, hey, what do you think? If I could have my own class. He's like, own class of what? I'm like, I don't know, like an innovation class. Well, what does that pertain? I'm like, what they bring to it. You know, like if, like if they're really passionate about something, we, we take some of their inquiry and take some of their drive and passion and, you know, like the Daniel Pink TED Talk. And he says, I'll tell you what, Don, if there is a Daniel Pink TED Talk description in this course catalog, you can have it. So really what he said was no, but I heard yes. Right. <laughs> and um, the fact that we're not sued by our students for the first couple of years, we don't know what we're doing. We're trying our best, but we keep assessing what we do wrong mm. and we move. And so I, I started to realize that, you know, education needed a shake up. And um, so on we went. And, and I think that the other great tipping point um, was Twitter. Um, we started to, when we were doing things that were unusual or out there, we were taking a risk and saying, here's what we're doing. And, and even admitting when we're wrong, we're like, we'll never do this again. But owning it, right? Just being as transparent as we can. And um, also not just trying to put on airs of what we were about, but also saying, here's what we can't do. And, and, and the learning process of this, and so on and so forth. And um, that's just kind of our mindset, is the constant reflection and doing prototyping and, and going on and on and on. I wanna go back a little bit. Um, I think that the big mistake with you would be to pigeonhole, and that's, I really tried to cover that in the intro, the mistake would be to pigeonhole you into just thinking of you as a high school teacher or, or honestly just being tied to an educational system because I think that what you do really does apply to business, it could apply to a family. Obviously, I'm looking at it from the business perspective, mm -hmm. looking at you, literally you struggling with the exact same things sure. that I struggle with with the, the people here, and um, I know that you connected yesterday with our Director of Training and Knowledge, and that was a really interesting connection for me because we have a sincere desire to build out a university within the company. Yeah. Now, the reason that we wanna do that is because, one, I feel that same sense of obligation that you feel to your students, to the people that work here. Uh, I want Quest to be the most beautiful thing that's ever happened to any employee that touches it. We obviously do not have 100% success rate there, I'll be the first to admit it. But one of the things that I think we need to do to get there is acknowledge that people are making educational decisions now based on what they can afford, right. right? So, and you couple that with people stay at the same company now for an average of like two and a half years. Right. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. So companies are doing a really bad job of maintaining the loyalty of the people that they work hard to get within the organization that they mm -hmm. train. And more importantly for us to become imbued with the culture. And the culture is the single most difficult yeah. thing to transmit. Now in culture, I'm gonna wrap in the things that you teach. So here's what's fascinating for me and the reason I was so excited to have you on the show is you have to break people down first and then build them back up, right? And you yeah. talk about the unlearning process. So explain to us what the unlearning process is, how students walk into your class and that goal number one of unlearning, what is it? <sighs> So I'm gonna go all Star Wars on you. Um, um, you had me at hello. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, this is Yoda 101. People ask me, you know, what do I teach? The first six weeks is culture build. What is ideation? What is thinking? Um, what does it mean to um, be happy in failure? Actually, a lot of times in the first couple of days, we talk about what we love. Or conversely, sometimes we talk about what we hate. Because, you know, I have high school kids and sometimes before they love and trust you, they're not gonna necessarily open up right away. So I remember one year I started off with things that you hate about school. And they were slowly building the case that everything they didn't like about traditional school, the exact opposite, was the class. So after a while, they do start thinking about this mindset. And they do start thinking, oh, now the bad side of it is, and this is where sometimes I don't necessarily make friends, is that this affects some grades. I had, a, I had a couple students last year, their parents called and said, look, we, we love what the class is, we love what he's doing, 
But here's the reality. In those two hours he used to dedicate towards homework a night, he's dedicating about 15 minutes. Now, he's working on his business plan. Yeah. He's working on his design, whatever. Yeah. But it's hurting his grades. Mm. What do you say? And that's the tough thing. And, and I think um, when you see somebody on a, on a path of, of passion and of inquiry, you don't want to stop it. But the reality is this is also another good Zen or Yodo thing of this is also balance. So we have some kids that just go crazy with ideas and their grades slip, but we also have life skills along the way. Um, reading about your students, seeing your unlearning process, and people used to, so I used to use a very weird interviewing technique. I actually don't use it anymore, and sometimes I think that's the right answer, and sometimes I think it's the wrong answer, but in the beginning, I specifically was trying to break you down. Not break you down to make you sad about yourself or anything, to break you down to get you to see the flaws in your thinking, which is merely a construct, mm -hmm. and you can change that paradigm at any time and start looking at the world a new way. So let's take your concept of opportunities are everywhere. Right. If your mental construct is opportunities are only offered to the rich and the educated, well, then that's what you're going to see in life because you're right. so convinced right. that you don't. He's got this great story, guys. I go on and on about people and doing the research outside of the show because we can't cover everything. But he's got this amazing story about going to NFL press stakes or in Indianapolis. Uh, and he says, let's just show up looking professional and look for opportunities. And the kids are like, oh, I don't want to go. Like, we're never going to get anything. He's like, please, just dress nice. Let's do this. Let's be professional. And it ends up that they run into this guy who they recognize, nobody else does. They do a really professional interview with him playing the I'm just a student card. And the guy was originally not gonna do any interviews that day, ends up doing interviews and getting them inside, which they didn't have tickets to do. I mean, it was just like one thing after another spirals and you've said that you could write a book about that, yeah. just that one day, that's right? Crazy. So, And that's, that's just one, one mindset shift, right? Of going from thinking there is a dearth of opportunity to just repeating over and over and over that opportunities are everywhere. And just having your eyes open for the opportunity when he whispered in the student's ear, go grab that guy and let's interview him. If the student at that point had not done it, had believed that there was no opportunity in that, then it would have gone nowhere. But in just literally walking up and tapping him on the shoulder and saying, hey, can I interview you? I'm a student. It changed everything about that day and it ends up getting written about in the book and they get covered by the media there at the event. I mean, it was bonkers. So getting people to do those initial mindset shifts to me is, is everything. And that's what we're trying to do. Now I'm trying to do it because it's good for business. I'm also trying to do it because it's good for the person. So that, right, in that interview, I was trying to say the mindset that you have walking in this door is a mindset of scarcity, yeah. fear. Okay. We're going to stop that. And I need you to recognize that's where you are. Now I'm guessing this is what you're going through with the students mm -hmm. and then showing them you're going to be terrified by freedom, but freedom is going to end up being the powerful thing, and it's the thing that leads to the entrepreneurship. And you actually have a, a quote about it. Um, so this is you talking about the people that look at that with fear. It's easier and less stressful to be told what to do rather than be given the freedom to come up with what you want to learn. Like That quote freaked me out. Why, why do you think it's less stressful? Because I agree, but why is it less stressful to be told what to do than to think for yourself? It's easier to be told. Um, uh, we reap what we sow, first of all. Teachers have been telling students, your reward is the grade. Right. And therefore, you don't have to think. Sit down, shut your mouth, I'll tell you what to think. Um, that's easy. Now, we complain that it's boring. We complain that it's not engaging. But when it gets down to it, I'm like, okay, now here's your opportunity. And that's, that's where the hard part is, is at first is convincing a lot of times the A, straight A students. You know, it's like, we had an agreement here. I'm quiet, I'm subservient, I'm a nice kid. Now you're telling me that I should be loud and walk around and collaborate? So I know the number one question you get asked is, how do I find my passion? So you give them the freedom, they're gonna do what they want, anything you want, first they're terrified, then they realize, okay, I'm gonna give this a go, but I don't know what I'm passionate about. Right. How do you actually walk them down that path to discovery? Eventually, you don't walk them down. I mean, you, you, you hold your hand as long as you can, but that comfort of, I'm not gonna fail you for failing. Knowing what you don't love, you cross off your list, but if they were given a small part of the day, an innovation class, to find out, in some cases, if they spent the year finding out what they just hate. I mean, I'll be the number one thing I keep finding again and again is students are like, I'm gonna learn how to code. 
I'm gonna learn how to code. All right, you know how boring coding is? I mean, this is for me. Sure. This and this, some people, it's fantastic. But a lot of students, that when they find out that it's not as exciting as they thought it would be, then they're like, check it off my box. Right. They might have gone and majored in that, suffered through it. And I think the other component is, and I think this is when teachers ask me, what's the, what's the default thing that you should go to? I don't think you can ever, ever, ever go wrong with service learning. When you add value to other people, you understand yourself so much more. If you are learning in the service of others, it makes you feel great about yourself and then you realize that you're working on something bigger than yourself. So how do you help them? So even service learning is itself very broad. Do you have a, a system by which you break that journey down? Questions that they should ask themselves or? Just don't be afraid, you know? And, and, and when things don't work out, that's cool too. Which is again why I grade on them, I, the only thing I really assess them on is the things that you said you're going to do, did you do it? And if you didn't, why? How do you teach overcoming obstacles? Because your kids have pulled it. Like, filing for a patent yeah. is gnarly. Yeah. I filed for patents with attorneys on staff, and it sucks. So <laughs> how do you get, I mean, they have to, like, go out and find somebody that's going to help them. Right. This is crazy. So we, who, who makes that phone call? They do. How do you convince them to do that? Because it's Just hard do enough. it, man. Just do it. I mean, That's no, it. mind you, I'm a, okay, so if you haven't noticed, I live and breathe this stuff. So sometimes sure. it is like, this is going to be awesome, right? <laughs> and I convince them because like, okay, it's going to be awesome. Leave me alone. <laughs> um, but that's just it. Don, can I offend every one of the people that you know that's going to watch this? Sure. Okay. So for the, no, for like, this isn't me saying it. This Don. is clearly not Don saying this. Um, the best piece of advice, and it echoes through my life to this day, and of course it was said by an incredibly crass man, uh, but it, it stuck with me partly because the crassness got my attention. And he said, you don't get laid if you don't ask. And I thought, I was so shy to ask. Mm -hmm. when, and he was telling me that because here was, he saw this very clear solution. Right. Kid, if you just go ask, like they might do X, Y, Z for you. Right, right. And I, I'll do an impression because it's really funny if you know the way that he talks. And this is actually what he said. Guy, 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 come here, come here. You don't get laid if you don't ask. And I was like, this guy's so weird, oh my God. <laughs> But it was, it's one of those things, like when your dad said, don't teach the same class yeah. the same year, 20 years. Right. It just, at the time, you kind of brush him off and think, okay, whatever, this guy's kook. But then you really start thinking about, wow, what could I ask for and really get? Like, could I call a law firm up as a 17-year-old kid and say, hey, I need help filing a yeah. patent? Can I walk up to the guy in the NFL and say, hey, I'd like to do an interview, I'm a student? Could you walk up to somebody and say, hey, we um, need a new ingredient and we're going to have to work with you to get this done in a different way? Hey, we need a new piece of equipment, but it doesn't exist yet. Will you help us work on that? Um, I just got a letter from a guy and the opening line uh, to me was, you don't know me and I'm not what you're looking for, but I'm exactly what you need. <laughs> and I thought, good on you, man. Yeah. Like it got my attention, awesome. right? right? Because, and how many other people are better suited for me? How many other people are actually the person that I'm looking for, but they never write and I never find them. So the guy right. or the gal that actually does the reaching out, the person that actually steps out of their comfort zone and asks for something, like they actually get it. And I, it, it drives me crazy, Don, that people, they are fooled by my title. They are absolutely fooled by my title. And you and a couple of other people have pierced the veil and just like, hey, Tom, will you come teach a class to my students? Why, I'm sorry? Because I asked, right? It's right. a great opportunity. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. Of course I will, I'd love to. And people get, they get fooled by that and they think that somehow I know something they don't or I'm removed from them in some way or I don't exist in the same realm they do or get excited by the same things that they get excited about so they, they don't approach me. Or they quit after the first time. For sure. On the other hand, the people that say no, sometimes they're just too busy, but also sometimes we can sniff out who really is in it for the greater good. And, sure. and we didn't prep, we didn't talk about this. So I fell in love with your Quest University team yesterday, and they were talking about they want independent thinkers. And they start talking about what they expect. And you have people that are, it's their job to find and curate great content and just find stuff that's out there. And they're saying, yeah, we, we, we want 
people here to be happy. And people truly aren't happy if they're subservient. We hugged. Because <laughs> that, that's all, I, that's all, you right. know, that's all your team wanted, that's all I wanted. Um, and, and I think that's the way you create a real revolution. And so, ask a, ask a kid that's eight years old to show off their Minecraft wares. Oh man, it's on. And those kids are awesome. What if you had a time, you're like, okay, so I know you already have a passion in Minecraft. I don't know, you think maybe a team of two or three of you could build a super city? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, well, could you find an expert out there? You know how many Minecraft experts there are on YouTube? Reach out to them. And by the way, do you think the Minecraft people on YouTube that already have a decent following wouldn't like an additional 200 followers from that school? Iron sharpens iron. And then you get these kids after a while, they feel so emboldened, they're like, I'll ask anybody. <laughs> and that's how you change it. Right. It's those little bits of success. So I'm, I'm, I'm begging anybody. It, it, I'm not trying to rip on all education, but I'm just, I'm not happy with a sweet subservient kid. There's a lot of kids that have been told they're stupid and they're not. They're really, really smart, but they didn't play the student game. They went on, did their own thing they drop out and they're angry. And that's actually the way we want to start the, this, this prison class. I want to go in there and I, I want to ask them, where did I go wrong? Where did we go wrong? Clearly we didn't serve your needs because you're here, but I value your insights. I know that you probably got something you're super intelligent about. How can we draw that out of you? That's the way we transform things. No other way. Yeah, that concept of everybody's an expert in something um, if you take that and you marry it to not being afraid to ask, and you talk about that, right? The collect and connect. Yeah. Really, it's uh, a brilliant thing these guys do. So brainstorming sessions, they get up and they put things down, could be random, you know, like in this example. Uh, but then you start drawing connections between those otherwise seemingly disparate ideas. Um, and then some really interesting things happen. So when people realize that, okay, somebody could be, like everyone in this room is an expert at something, and the connection I'm gonna make to that is, oh yeah, don't be afraid to ask anybody anything. So now you start asking these people, in what way are you an expert? And you talk about this in the book, you sort of hinted at it there with the Minecraft thing, but you said you've had students that were like just absurdly gifted, they could create Minecraft servers, and you know, just their, their level of knowledge is absolutely ridiculous. And he said, imagine you have a class and you've got guys that are so good at Minecraft that they can build their own servers, let alone actually build the city, and you make them sit with somebody who's a beginner and you tell them we're all gonna learn at the same pace. And you've got the student who can already build the servers, like he's going out of his mind. And that was actually the first time where I had a visceral understanding of uh, the problem with education. For me, the bad news was, I was that median kid that you pitched to, so it's perfect for me. Mm -hmm. I, you were always learning right at my level, I loved it. And I never understood, like some of my friends who were like bored or whatever, I'm like, I'm working my ass off over here. Right. But he's talking about you bored. Um, so it's, yeah, that really made it clear to me that, that there has to be a paradigm shift in education. Um, and I think one of the things that you're responding to with the Quest University is, so I'm backing into the education from saying, okay, I started as that median student. I got really good grades. Mm -hmm. I cheated and charmed my way through high school mm -hmm. and I worked myself blind through college. Yep. And that was how I got good grades in both instances. But it was always geared towards what is gonna get me a good grade. It was not geared towards innovating. Right. And then getting into the real world and going into a startup for the first time and getting my ass handed to me every day because there was, there was nothing other than binary success or failure. Right. And I'm gonna write an article called What I Learned Playing First Person Shooters because you're either alive or you are dead. That's it, and if you're dead, your strategy sucked. If you're alive, your strategy's good. Right. And that's what business is like. There is no grade, right? Grade is the, the safety equivalent in your school of I don't know if you did anything, but you got the grade. Right. I don't know if you'll go on to be an effective employee. I don't know if you can go run a business, uh, but you got a good grade. Right. And that works for getting you into higher education, but then that sort of weird cycle repeats. But the reason that we want people to think for themselves, and by the way, like PSA, boys and girls, it is the most selfish thing that we could do. We do not look for free thinkers because I think it'll be fun. I look for free thinkers because that is what this company needs in order to end metabolic disease, which is our stated goal. And as this group knows, 
Much like your students hate it when you repeat, there's opportunity everywhere. These guys love hearing me remind them that we do and believe that which moves us towards our goals. We do not do or believe that which moves us away from our goals. And that really is the driving factor. But that's why we look for that, right? right. That's why hearing you trying to set people free is so interesting. But do you share that? Like, why are you trying to set them free? What does it mean to you? I just want them to be happy. I would have bet money that would be your answer. Yeah. So now you're going to force me to go a level deeper. Oh, Why do you think it. that will make them happy? It's universally true. Why? Because I'm not even sure what you mean by that. Uh, I mean, I understand the words to know that you're true, but. to know first. First of all, to know that you're used for a purpose. We, we only have a couple of basic needs, and a lot of a lot of it is to be loved. Um, when we bring value to others, we're just happier. Period. And but what does it have to do with free thinking? Like that's that's really beautiful, and I could easily let you off the hook. Right. But what I want to know is why does free thinking? Like I know why it interests me. It's the hero's journey still. Okay. Okay. So it's the weird duality of life. For uh, for us to know happiness, we have to have gone through sadness. Right. Matter of fact, we, we talk about it, and I too share your same enthusiasm for Carol Dweck's mindset. You know, the worst possible um, environment for a growth mindset is our schools. Yeah. You have a binary system. You either, you either got an A on this or you didn't. Growth is, if you start, if, say if on your first attempt you get an A on a test, was it really hard? You know, you're a workout guy. Could, could you imagine approaching the bench press and doing your body weight for the first time? 10 reps? No. There's constant growth. And knowing that you're just totally going to suck on your first attempt is the way it should be. So a lot of times when we free think, we're allowed to fail. We're allowed to say, wasn't that awesome? And by the way, that is learning. Did anybody learn to walk on their first step? No. We always learn through failure. Yet at some point, right around kindergarten, first, second, third grade, we get into this idea of, don't you mess up. If you mess up, you're going to get a bad grade. In a growth mindset classroom, this is going to be tough. This is going to be arduous and I'm gonna grade you on improvement. Now, here's my other point though. <sighs> this is now then on them. The responsibility is on the student. So I, have, I have led that horse to the water and they didn't drink. I have allowed some students to say, hey, this is what we need to buy into. And in the end, no. Because the old system, while boring, or less engaging, is easier. And so if you want it to be a rewarding journey, it's going to be harder than sit down, write this test, take this, you know, whatever. Will you do me a favor? Yeah, man. Think of the horse that you most were impressed with. You kind of had a little love for them just because of their raw talent. You walked them right up to the water and they didn't drink. Yeah. If you had it to do over, how would you get them to drink? Hold their hand and tell them, I want you you're thinking of something fail. specific right now? Yeah. Okay. You want them to fail? Yeah. Why that? Because they'll learn how you to think not they fail were, later. So do you think they were afraid to fail? Was that the thing that of ultimately course. stopped Of course. Them? That's, that's why when people get in arguments with me like, well, students don't like failure. No one does. Have you ever seen, you've seen a kid play video games? <laughs> they love to die. <laughs> Ask any kid. You sunk $60 in your video game. Mm -hmm. You beat it on the first try. You don't even get shot once. Well, I want my money back. <laughs> There's no challenge in that. Kids love failure, just not school. Kids love the challenge. We all do. It's why we love an underdog. You made a really powerful point about the video game thing. Uh, I remember my friend and I, back when you couldn't save a game, you either played oh. until you won or you started over. Yeah. There was nothing in between. Right. And we would take turns sleeping so that we could keep going until we finally beat this game. Right. And that, like, you're right. It was, it was the obsession that oh, the yeah. difficulty brings out in you. And if people can find that thing, and this, I was thinking about this in your class. Honestly, honestly, Don, what you're asking them to do is impossible. It's impossible for adults. You're abusing children, Don. <laughs> I literally can't. Like, you're saving them and abusing them at the same time. It is so 
amazing and crazy and unbelievable to me that you, you've created this bubble in the school that gives me hope. That is the highest praise I can pay you. As somebody, literally my, my ease into this was gonna be, as somebody who's hiring people out of the US school system, right. for the love of God, will you please keep going with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because those are the things that, that I need because when people are just sitting around waiting to be told, that sucks for them. Mm -hmm. Like, Don, that sucks for them. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about me, I'll worry about the company. Right. You don't have to worry about me, you don't even have to worry about the company. Just for you, that sucks. Right. Like, if you're sitting around and you feel incapable of moving forward, the amount of frustration that must bring to you creates that, like, the, the world is just impossible to move mentality. Yeah. Because you don't, take that ownership of I'm gonna try this and I may fail. I may be a bloody stain on the carpet, but I'm gonna try right. and I'm gonna get back up and try again. Absolutely fascinating, thank you. You triggered all that with a simple thought about video games. Um, now, one last thing, confession. And I am in the lucky, lucky from my perspective, horrifyingly unlucky from your perspective. I don't have kids right. and I don't plan to have kids. But the friction that I can see when I think about parents mm -hmm. and what you're going through and what we touched on a little bit earlier of, I want you to get into a good school. I mm -hmm. totally get that. And the world cares enough about it mm -hmm. that I need to think about that. But the reality is, Don, I have a degree in filmmaking. Nobody cares about that. No one has ever once asked me if I graduated, nor have they asked me what my GPA was, mm -hmm. nor am I using I mean, now it's a bit of a cheat because yes, okay, like I use a little bit of it, but I certainly did not get where I am using film techniques. Um, so it's, it has been the falling in love, falling in love with learning process that you talk so eloquently about. Um, what does this look like in the future? I know you reinvent yourself every year, so what are you doing to push that forward? I've never been so uncertain in my future and I've never been happier about it. And I want it that way. Um, I just want to, make my dent in the future. Sure. Um, and um, I think that's what I'm trying to do, create a new status quo to where someday, maybe five years, maybe 10 years, people will go, remember when school, there was no time in the day where you couldn't learn the things that you wanna learn? Think about that. I want school to be a part of it to where it is an innovation factory. You can get all these minds coming together, sharing ideas, and then doing something about it. Right. Instead of just brainstorming and saying, that was fun. Instead of reading it about it in a textbook, how to start a business, open up to page 17. Oh, <laughs> yes. Instead, we do something about it. That's wow. what I'm looking forward to. That's a perfect ending. Thank you so much, man. Thank that you. That was incredible. Thanks. Guys. You're in for a treat of ongoing education as you dig into this man. You can find him many places online. At Don Wetrick is his Twitter handle. He's hyperactive there. You've got lots going on on YouTube. Where should they find you there? NHS Innovation is the YouTube channel. Uh, now that I've done the show, we'll start picking up a little bit more content. We used to do it every other week, so we're going to get back on that. Awesome. He's also written the book, Pure Genius. Check it out. I'm telling you, it applies to business. It applies to family life as much as it applies to education. You will find incredibly powerful lessons. In life, I've met a lot of people that talk about change and very few people who instigate change. This man is truly a change agent. And the deeper you go into his world, just by looking at his students, you will see that the things that, I have the chills, you will see the things they are doing are absolutely destroying the status quo and bringing a breath of fresh air to what education could be. This guy is incredibly integrated with a lot of other people. He is the entry point to a very deep and exciting spider web that goes all throughout education in this country and other countries. It will give you hope to explore that and I promise it will give you things you can apply to your own life. It's absolutely incredible. All right, guys, this is a weekly show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And if you want to get tickets, you can get tickets and sit in the audience. These guys are going to pounce on this kid as soon as he walks off the stage. So that's the, the trade-off of actually coming in here and being a part of the show. You can go deeper with people. Uh, you can find us at InsideQuest.com and click on the tickets page to get tickets. Otherwise, you can find me at, at Tom Bilyeu, and you can find the show at, at InsideQuest. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. It is an honor. We do not take it for granted. Until next week, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Yeah. Don, thank you so much.